So hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Today we have with us Carl Holland uh, to talk about CRM archaeology specific to California. Now, just so we're on the same page here, CRM refers to cultural resource management. And of the three main types of archaeology jobs in America, CRM is the biggest uh, next to you know, government work and uh, academia. But CRM is something that not a lot of people know really what it is. So we'll get into that today. And Carl, first of all, thank you for joining us. It's really good to see you. Glad to be here. All right. So my first question for you is, and this is something I think will surprise people, is that you're an archaeologist, but you work for a gas company, which on paper, you know, I, I you know, it doesn't really make sense. So why would a gas company hire an archaeologist? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, we get this question actually from employees of the gas company too when they uh, when they learn what we do. But uh, large scale utilities like the gas company um, have a lot of infrastructure that was put in um, over the course of decades that needs regular maintenance. So, uh, you know, when you think of uh, gas infrastructure, you know, you think of pipelines in the ground, and those kind of things can impact cultural resources. So, uh, one of the ways in which we assist uh, projects going on with the gas company is to determine whether or not there are any cultural resources in the area in which they're working. And if there are going to be any disruptions to those resources, we try and do our best to protect them. Now, I'm guessing that the gas company doesn't do it just because it feels like it and they're nerdy about archaeology like we are, um, that there might be some sort of, you know, prodding um, to, to kind of force them to consider archaeology. And I know that there's a bunch of laws in the books about, um, you know, archaeology and, and when uh, organizations have to consider it. Um, at the national level, you've got laws like NAGPRA or Section 106 of the NHR. Nope, no, nope, because that would be the National Hot Rod Association. National <laughs> NHPA. Um, and, uh, but those deal with kind of like, you know, on, on like a national scale. Uh, on the state level, is there a main body of legislation that um, gets companies like the one that you work for to to have to consider archaeology? Yeah, I'd say apart from public resource code, we deal most with the California Environmental, Environmental Quality Act, uh, CEQA, uh, which involves a number of environmental disciplines under kind of a general uh, environmental compliance uh, system. Um, CRM fits into that by um, mandating that uh, a project that is subject to CEQA, uh, which is any project with a discretionary level uh, action by a uh, state level agency, so city, county, uh, the state, uh, must go through a process with which cultural resources are um, um, examined in the area. So we need to do uh, what's called a record search. We need to do a, um, a desktop level analysis, and then we possibly would need to go out and do some field work as well. And that can follow up into the other phases of, of uh, CRM work, which essentially is um, uh, examination, um, uh, evaluation, testing, and possible data mitigation. And what is the end goal of all of that? Like, you know, in terms of like your testing and your evaluation, what what are you evaluating it for? Well, you're evaluating for something called significance. And when you evaluate something for the <clears throat> what's called the California Register of uh, Historical uh, Resources, I believe that's the, still the, uh, the nomenclature, um, you you evaluate it for uh, key significance criteria. You know whether or not it is an important site. Um, it's associated with an important person or an event or display some sort of um, you know, engineering um, innovation or kind of new technique throughout history. Um, so when you kind of take a lot of those pieces together, you can truly evaluate a site as it relates to the California Register. And if something is found to be um, significant enough to list on the register, then it's deemed a significant resource and it therefore falls under certain protections um, mitigation and uh, ways in which we have to design our project possibly even differently to avoid that resource. So from what I understand, the, the key thing that kind of holds all this together is deciding whether some archaeological site uh, is significant 
to be uh, on this California register. Um, and, and that kind of drives the whole thing. Now, uh, today, you know, in your current job, do you go out and like look for these sites to, to see if they're significant? Or is that something that you do not do? I don't do that anymore. Um, I can when I want to have a little bit of fun. Uh, okay. But for the most part, I'm in the office. So what I do is I evaluate projects that come to our, uh, our department within the utility. Uh, and I evaluate them for uh, whether or not they are um, exempt from CEQA or if they are beholden to CEQA. And then that kind of guides the process I take with that project. And if I determine that there is a project that has uh, you know, a CEQA compliance related issue, um, I actually go out and I hire a archeological consulting firm to, uh, to do that work for us. Uh, so they typically go out uh, and they perform a field survey and they let us know what kind of resources are there. And then we kind of take a next step approach on whether or not our project might possibly impact those resources, if those resources are significant and what we can possibly do to mitigate any kind of uh, um, impact to those resources should the project not be able to um, be designed in a way that doesn't impact them. Right on. So you are in a, a pretty crucial position to basically say like, is everything that the company is doing, is it right? Is it to the law? Are we doing uh, what we're supposed to? And are these archeologists doing what they're supposed to as well? Now, I, I know for a fact that um, back in the day, you were one of those people who'd go out and do that initial looking for, for uh, archeology span sites because I was with you. This is about 10 years ago or so, I'm gonna say. Um, and, I was wondering if you'd be uh, comfortable just talking about that experience. Like what, what you, what's the first step when you're out there and like, okay, our archaeology company's hired. We have to go see if this, you know, area of land has archaeology sites. Uh, what, what do they do? What, what, what happens next? Sure. So, uh, you know, what we typically do is we work closely with our GIS folks. Um, you know, archaeology, CRM, and GIS really go hand to hand these days. Um, with how we go about uh, planning for surveys and um, our field equipment is uh, very uh, GIS based. Typically we're going out with uh, a submeter accurate Trimble or um, you know, um, a similar kind of device. And we'll have maps produced and uh, areas that we wanna examine that you know, could be possibly impacted by the project. So we'll take all of that and then uh, we, will, uh, we will get going and we'll head out to the field. And then we, as either a single person or in a group, will walk in uh, standard uh, transects, which are essentially just straight lines over a project spaced at even intervals so that everyone can get a look at the ground surface in a um, you know, systematic way so that we cover the entire of the project area. And hopefully, you know, we, we find something and, and there's something to record and uh, we do that on our Department of Parks and Recreation uh, DPR forms, uh, which are standard in the industry of CRM in California. Uh, they have kind of uh, relevant fields with which to fill out um, all the site information that you might have uh, in the field. So you do that while you're there in the field, you fill out as much information as you can. You know, I know there are lots of CRM firms that have uh, moved to kind of tablet-based interfaces. So that's a common thing you see in the field these days. And then you take your Trimble and you take points. It's what it's called is essentially you get um, a la long locations for uh, all of the significant artifacts in your site. You get a site boundary and then it, it all kind of comes together back at the office. Part of it is also, you know, being able to do, uh, you know, long surveys over um, sometimes difficult terrain. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of an adventure. Yeah, man. I remember you took boots really seriously. And I, I, I'll be honest, at first I thought I was a little bit like nerdy. I was like, God, this guy's really into boots. <laughs> but there's a reason you're really into boots because like you will end up like having your shoes ripped from your feet on like harsh desert surfaces after you've done this for a few weeks. Um, and then I became into boots. So, you know, <laughs> uh, archeologists are into boots. I think it's fair to say. So let's say that you have done the survey and you have a couple sites you think are significant. Uh, what happens at that point? 
Well, depending on what kind of site it is, uh, you know, a large portion of it might be subsurface. Yeah. And, you know, when you're out there, obviously you can see what's, what's on the ground and on the surface, but you're not going to be doing any digging. Uh, you know, a phase two, which is, you know, the evaluation of a subsurface archaeological site can really give you the information you need in order to make that determination. So uh, a phase two is uh, essentially um, what we call, you know, site testing. And we do that typically by um, uh, what are called shovel test pits, possibly a, um, a single uh, one by one meter unit. Um, and we can place them throughout the site in kind of a randomized way to determine whether or not there's any subsurface to that site. And if there is, you know, what's the disposition of that site? Is it, uh, you know, completely intact? Uh, has it been disturbed before? Um, has it been churned up by um, you know, farming activity or looters? So that'll help us get a lot more information that tells us whether or not a site uh, has what we call further data potential. So you, let's say that you found um, uh, some subsurface remains in this phase two, and you've got yourself like a, a good old fashioned archeological site, but there is a, uh, a, a stadium being built or like, you know, a, the, the port needs to come through here. Some really important infrastructure thing. Um, what, what can you do at that point? Even if it seems like the site might be significant. Sure. So, you know, once we do our phase two and we determine a site to be significant enough to be listed for uh, one of the registers, you know, we, we need to first determine whether or not, you know, there's human remains, which, you know, is a completely different question. Um, and then whether or not, uh, you know, this site can either be completely avoided, um, capped, which is another kind of method of uh, essentially protecting a site in place. If none of that's possible and we do have to disturb the site, then uh, typically we'll do something called data recovery, which is essentially what is called exhausting the data potential of a site. So that means collecting anything that could give us information about uh, the, the eligible portions of that site, what gives it its eligibility. So if it's you know, a specific piece of engineering, it'll be about you know, documenting, uh, photographing, and preserving that portion of the site. If it's about whether or not it can tell us something about prehistory, it's about collecting artifacts. It's about collecting associations between those artifacts and the locations to a really high degree of accuracy. So that should the site be destroyed, it can be studied by archeologists later in the future. Now, I'm gonna ask you for your opinion on things. So just, you know, I wanna make sure that at this point we're getting into our, our feelings uh, about issues. But uh, now that we understand the process of CRM in California, I'm wondering what you think about its success. Uh, you know, do you think the goal of CRM archaeology, which is fulfilling um, the, the legal obligations uh, that we have to kind of determine if there are historic, um, significant archaeological sites, um, is that enough to preserve California's history, do you think? Like, are we, good as, are we, are we at a good spot? Uh, it's a really big question. Um, and, you know, my thoughts might not match everyone's thoughts, but uh, from my perspective, I think uh, the CRM industry is quite robust in the state of California. I think we actually do quite a good job of uh, doing large scale surveys, uh, doing uh, adequate testing and mitigation. Um, I think overall the process is, um, is quite sound in the way we go about approaching um, you know, these types of projects. I think where you know, CRM can do better is in engagement with the public. I think that a lot of the times people really don't understand you know, that not only is there a CRM industry, but you know, what it's actually producing. You know, a lot of the times the, the reports, the information, and understandably so is confidential. Uh, you know, we don't want to be giving away, you know, um, you know locations of, of archaeological sites that could be looted. But there is a, um, I think there's a component there that we could do better. You know, more of a, um, you know, regional synthesis of information that can be disseminated to the public in a way that that helps keep them engaged. And um, you know, I think that piece is still kind of 
waiting to come about via more legislation, really. Um, you know, the what most of these serum firms do essentially is, you know, follow the letter of the law, you know, uh, write these evaluations, you know, protect the resources. But when it comes to having the communities in which these res resources are, understand them and appreciate them, I think we can do a lot better. Absolutely. Yeah, no, um, I think that's a really good idea that you put forward that maybe there needs to be some like extra initiative um, that says you need to kind of summarize things in a, in a general way. So you're not giving away, hey, looters, here's where to look, but also, hey, you know, uh, kids in school or like people who just care about where they grew up. Um, this is what we learned. Um, Cause I've kind of been frustrated myself at how we really in California do favor the exclusion of this information, um, which is very protective of the sites that exist. And, and I think that's very important, but like even me as like someone who's, you know, a professionally trained archeologist, it can be difficult to get your hands on that info. Um, you know, you have to go through a, a kind of an application process just to look at a couple of papers from like the seventies or the eighties or something, you know, like, um, so I do, I think that um, you're totally right about public. And I wonder if like we could maybe streamline things for, for academics and researchers and folks that want to um, kind of synthesize things. Um, I'm not sure if you'd agree on that. No, I completely agree. You know, um, for, for Christmas, I was actually gifted a, uh, you know, a history of the town in which I recently moved. And uh, you know, it's one of those, um, I think they're, I don't know what the, the company who distributes them is, but they're, they're kind of all over the place. You see them in little gift shops and things, you know, the history of your little town. And typically they'll have a, a little prehistory section. And, um, you know, it was, it was about four pages of very, very, very general information. Nothing really actually pertaining to the town mm -hmm. um, in which it was supposed to be talking about. And then it went into a great deal more of, you know, European uh, history, and uh, you know, more recent events. But you know, even something as simple as uh, you know, providing to, uh, to the public you know, more competent write-ups, more individualized to certain regions, uh, you know, a synthesis of, of what's kind of going on in the, uh, the realm of archaeology in your area, um, I think that would do a lot more to help people feel more interested and more engaged. Yeah, man. Like I'm, I'm doing like the snaps thing or whatever you're supposed to do to like show agreement. <laughs> um, that that would be wonderful. And I wonder if too that would help people just kind of care more about uh, our history. You know, our our state's past. Um, well, um, I'm gonna ask uh, one more question for you. Um, but um, thank you so much so far for for all this information. This last question is. Just in general, what has been your favorite um, place to work or your favorite part of being a California archaeologist? Uh, let's see. There's honestly, there are so many places in California that are just incredible uh, to see and, and work at. Um, you know, being an archaeologist in California has taken me all over the state to places, you know, I frankly didn't even know existed uh, until I, you know, was really working in them. You know, our work around the Tehachapi area was, I mean, it's a beautiful area to work in. Um, I did work in the Carrizo Plain. That is uh, an absolutely uh, beautiful place. Um, I've done uh, shovel test pits right on the beach in front of um, UC Santa Barbara, which was, you know, <laughs> a really nice place to work as well. Uh, you know, there are so many, uh, you know, beautiful sites and uh, really interesting um, uh, ways in which prehistory and history kind of collide in California that, you know, really kind of surprise. And there's always something new. Um, you know, it's it's kind of a thing that we like to do is, is sometimes we'll we'll find a site and we'll present it to the rest of our company and just being like, uh, or to the archaeologists of our company anyway, and say, you know, look what we found. This is cool. Isn't this, is this neat? Have you ever seen anything like this before? And, uh, you know, oftentimes we haven't, you know, there's, there's just new stuff every single day. So that's, a really cool benefit. Well, Carl, thank you so much for being here. Um, I really appreciate your time. And uh, thanks to everyone for watching.